Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's webinar. Uh, we are joined by Ross Strake, who is a pediatrician who specializes in pain medicine and palliative care for children, having gained fellowships in pediatrics in 2000, palliative medicine in 2003, and pain medicine in 2011. After he completed specialist training at Great Ormond Street in London and the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney. Ross is currently the clinical lead of pediatric palliative care and complex pain services at Starship Children's Hospital, both being the only service of their type in New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Drake is also regularly, uh, Dr. Drake also regularly presents and teaches on various topics in children's pain medicine and palliative care. More recently, he has been involved with establishing an international pharmacovigilance research collaborative looking at the effectiveness and adverse effects of medication and other interventions commonly used in palliative care and pain management. Uh, Ross will um, direct the question and answers today and we'll hand the time over to uh, Dr. Drake. Oh, thanks um, for that, Tim, and it's, it's great to be here and the opportunity to talk about pain and uh, children with um, uh, leukemia and, and blood cancers. Um, but really it's also, this, this also includes children who um, you know, have any kind of medical condition and at times no medical problem whatsoever. Just, uh, right. So I'm gonna split this, in, this, this little talk as we walk through it into two parts based on two case studies just to kind of ref bring my attention to, to um, the experience that uh, that child had and, and what we did to uh, assist and that, uh, do that, bring out some of the physiology and I'll try and not make that too boring. Um, and then some of the uh, management approaches that were helpful. Um, so just to start off with, you're fortunate in 2020 not to have COVID, but to have a new definition of um, pain, which has been 40 years uh, since it was first brought out. I think I'd just like to point out to you that it is now seen as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And I think that emotional part is hopefully will come out a little bit during the day. Um, and it's associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So it suggests you don't have to have damage to tissue. Um, they preface that with uh, six points. Um, <coughs> rather than read through that completely, I'll highlight the aspects. It's always a personal experience. Pain and notiception or the process of sensing pain are different phenomena. Individuals learn pain and a person's report should be respected. Uh, it's usually adaptive, but it can have quite adverse effects on the overall well-being of the person. And verbal description is only one behaviour to express pain. So for people that can't communicate or have limited communication, and for non-human animal species, pain is still an experience. This, uh, and this, this child, this baby, has a 61-day admission um, for complete diagnosis and for chemotherapy. Um, but in the first month, I just wanted to see what procedural procedures were done, what pain is associated with some of those procedures happened. And yes, while she has central lines, um, that is not without some level of distress and pain. Um, so Procedural pain in itself can become chronic pain. And it's there's four easy steps to deal with that. And um, in the US, there is this thing called the comfort promise, which hospitals take up. And they will introduce those four uh, strategies as a matter of course to, man, to minimize and aid for no procedural pain. So numbing, use of MMI and retop. Uh, for example, uh, for babies, the use of sucrose, and that's something that can um, minimise the pain experience, say, eight months of age. 
positioning a child in such a way that it's comfortable rather than restrictive and then all the distraction techniques that go with age appropriate care through from uh, bubble blowing through to the use of um, the iPad or, or Android to uh, distract with um, teenage gaming while they get the procedures done. Um, so for this uh, baby, if she had that procedural pain we just pointed out, she also has uh, soft tissue inflammatory pain and with all those bony lesions and bone pain. But alongside of that, there's all the other things that go with having a um, widespread systemic cancer. Uh, so she has secretory diarrhea, um, a paraneoplastic phenomenon in the end that was decided, but also along with that a clostridium uh, infection. Uh, and again, so if you've broken down skin around the neck and area, so this is standard uh, approach to good hygiene and barrier protection. The venous line axis issues that I alluded to before, uh, to lots of febrile neutropenia with two different pathogens, with prolonged antibiotics going with that. She had a gastrointestinal bleed, requiring transfusion. Uh, she had poor weight gain, so it became an asogastric fed, and there's a the discomfort of an asogastric being surgery. And then uh, follow up MRI scans showing an initial decrease in size but the persistence of the sacral mass. So we head on to um, uh, thought within that wider pain description, there are three different types of pain now recognised. The first being nociceptive pain, and that's one we all recognise as damage to uh, you know, not just um, tissue that's not nervous system or later on neurological. Um, and that's due to activation of nociceptors or the receptors that will send the messages that are received by the brain in pain, <clears throat> brain being the decider of pain. It is the decision maker. Everything before and after that is a message. Um, you know, and the causes for that of injury, disease or treatment related uh, things that we've just um, talked about. Just to break that down to what actually happens is a bit of going back to preclinical uh, years. So we have, if you look at, we've got a top uh, fibre and a bottom fibre in this thing, in, in this uh, diagram. And prior to that, on the um, left hand side of your screen is an example. That, that, that's a representation of the inflammatory changes that happen with damage to tissue. So the um, groups of cells, the macrophages, the eosinophils, the mast cells, the platelets, they all uh, are stimulated as they flow into the area um, in the blood. They release a variety of chemicals which are all inflammatory in nature. They all have receptors they attach to on the nerve um, and they set up activation response to the two nerve types that we can see in the um, <clears throat> figure diagram. So on the top we have the uh, C fibre, so the small fibre, it's unmyelinated, it sends high intensity stimuli <clears throat> that then activate the central nervous system pathways that lead to the perception of pain. On the bottom we have the large fibres, um, they're myelinated so they move a lot quicker and they're a low intensity message that's related to non-noxious stimuli such as touch or cold or proprioception or warmth. Um, and so those pathways work in parallel and they don't functionally intersect and the reason they don't do that is because of these little cells, um, green and blue, they are the inhibitory neurons that maintain the face of activity of the dedicated nerve. Yeah. Um, the, the comment around here about peripheral sensitization, that is purely when you damage an area, you develop a bruise and swelling, you touch that area, it's sore, so it's sensitized. And the idea is don't touch it, let it heal. Now, if we take those inhibitory cells, I just wanted to point out how they work. Um, what K 
came out in 1965 as one of the big revolutions in, in, in recognizing pain and pain um, development was the gate control theory. So if we look at the uh, top of that diagram, you have the uh, inhibitory neuron at the I marked in yellow, and it's actively firing all the time. So at rest, it's actively firing, which keeps both of the small fiber and the large fiber systems quiet. If we drop down to where the large fiber, so that's the one that transmits non-noxious stimuli, so touch and such, like <clears throat> when that's active, it reinforces the inhibitory fiber to keep the block on the small fiber. So it allows the large fiber to send its message through to the, to the brain. Then we go down to the bottom, and that's when the small fibers or the fibers that carry the um, message that's going to be perceived as pain. And let's call it a danger message because that's what it's telling you is danger. So when it fires, it puts a block on the inhibitory fiber, switches it off. So it allows itself to transmit its message through the brain. So you've got a, that's how the inhibitory fibers maintain the block. It's switched off by the small fibers and it's switched on more by the large fibers. So we get to the brain and this is, there's, there's three pathways in the brain that we have to be aware of. Um, and particularly for the onward message of the danger um, from the small fibers. So the green pathway is passes through a modulating center known as the thalamus on its way to the somatosensory cortex. And this is the locating area of the brain. So it locates where you saw and it gives you a level of intensity of the pain. So it's there to get your attention. And it gets your attention so that you get away from the danger if there's danger to get away from and then go into the process of allowing it to heal. The second pathway is the, uh, in, in the <clears throat> orange is the inhibitory descending pathway. As soon as the danger messages come up, they set off a downward pathway to inhibit and regulate the flow from the spinal cord. And that's just to make sure that we don't have um, us not swamped by these messages, by just inundated and overwhelmed by them. So, acute pain, it's understandable. It's a recognized stimulus that causes it to happen. It's often related to um, a tissue damage or, and, and the nature and extent of that damage. It's often a brief experience. It improves rapidly, and then rapidly meaning uh, days, but even within hours, the pain levels can change. And it does respond really well to different medication approaches. The acute pain strategies are pretty simple. There's non-pharmacological techniques and there's uh, medications, and we break those down into non-opioid medications and opioids. So strong pain inhibitors. Um, <clears throat> so for this young girl, she was started on non-pharmacological strategies, it's regular paracetamol for a bone and inflammatory pain, and she was started on a morphine infusion, which lasted for 10 days before we converted the oral to maintain management. Non-pharmacological strategies broken down into four groups, supportive, and they're all about empowering the child and the family and supporting them. And it's the simplest family-centered care as providing information, gaining understanding, knowledge is power. Um, and for a child who's going to be getting more frequent blood tests, as we've talked about, having a choice about which finger gives them some level of control and play is also very um, important on pharmacology. Children. <clears throat> then there's the cognitive strategy which influence the child's thoughts that goes with anything from distraction through to music to use those other parts of the brain that are competing against the messaging um, and then the imagery through the hypnosis options. Uh, the third is behavioral and that changes behavior so the deep relaxation or deep breathing um, muscle relaxation and then there's you know physical uh, <clears throat> methods which just work on 
you see it through systems, and that's as simple as touch, right through to uh, nerve stimulation as a counterirritant. So, non pharmacological strategies uh, work in, in unison with appropriate drug treatment. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's really important that you use both together. They are synergistic. One plus one equals three. And then we go into actual medications. We've got a really simple approach to that, and that's the World Health Organization ladder. Um, first step, depending on level of pain, if it's mild to moderate, you introduce a non opioid uh, pain reliever, and then pain is higher or the pain increases, then you move into a stronger pain reliever. In this case, the World Health Organization changed it to a two-step better and you move into a dose opioid. <clears throat> the reason it doesn't recommend coding is because of its uh, adverse effect profile in children um, and the fact that there are so many genetic variations of um, the the enzyme that changes coding to its active component, which is morphine, that there are a significant percentage of the population who don't actually convert into morphine and equivalent. Um, and then Tramadol has had uh, some recent um, changes to its uh, recommendations of prescribing, but also it does have a lack of evidence as through much, through much every pain medication we use has like a bit um, <clears throat> information on prescribing children. So they're all off label essentially. So look, I just want one thing about paracetamol, we use it. We buy it, we use it over the counter, um, and we never we think about how it works. And in fact for and it's been a drug that's been with us for over hundred years. Back in the 50s, it was felt to work like uh, anti-inflammatory medications like um, you know, ibuprofen by inhibiting the prostaglandin since this. But the problem with that is that those doses weren't really uh, something that we could stay for the length of time without the enterprise that can liver damage. And then in 2000s, just in the early 2000s, two different research groups came up with the same outcome by two different methodologies. One group read mice that did not have a certain receptor, the cannabinoid one receptor, and those mice did not respond to paracetamol for pain relief. The second group put a radio label on paracetamol and then watched it get converted in two steps into a from paracetamol as what they consider a prodrug into its active agent, which was got the glamorous name of AM404, AM404, which happens to be our endogenous cannabinoid. It's a cannabinoid we make. So everyone, the big thing at the moment is about cannabis and cannabis products for various treatments. So paracetamol, this group found, was converted into our endogenous cannabinoid we produce internally um, to have its action. So it's pretty strong evidence that in fact paracetamol was the original cannabinoid uh, used for management of pain and fever in, in, in children and, and adults. How do opioids work? I bring you back uh, to um, the inhibitory cell, which you will see in, in, in this diagram, is in yellow, um, and it produces, it releases our endogenous pain reliever, endorphins. And endorphins then act on the um, neuron that is carrying that high intensity danger message to prevent it being forwarded on to the central nervous system. So endogenous opioids inhibit the transmission to higher centers and so therefore you get pain reduction. Using that gate control theory, exogenous opioids like morphine, like um, fentanyl, like oxycodone work in exactly the same way on the same receptors to prevent on the transmission of before you get pain reduction. 
come back to our case, so she, after her 61 day admission, <coughs> she's discharged but the chance four days later with febrile illness uh, and significant irritability. She's found to have a third uh, line infection with the new bacteria. She is, um, she's treated with a change in line and antibiotics. She has produced urine output compared to a fractured disease. She's got new lesions on her scalp. Uh, bone marrow aspirate shows plus and her peripheral blood. And she has a head to toe um, or head to pelvis CT scan, which shows extensive intradotal disease which is actually impacting on her um, kidney function and her kidney um, processing of urine. <clears throat> so she requires a nephrostomy tube. Uh, she gets a, a treatment protocol change and then on to individualised protocol. And there's a decision made that bone marrow transplant is not going to be feasible or possible. So we've got, a, we've got a changed picture now for this girl. I mean, she has still got the nociceptive inflammatory base pain with soft tissue involvement and bone, but now she has also a neuropathic component to it, so a nerve involvement in this whole process. Um, in response to that, the nature of your medications change. Gabapentin's introduced nasogastrically, but there's concern that it's not really having any lack of absorption, but maybe just because it's not targeted in the right area. She's been on ketamine, she's been on morphine, she uh, moves to fentanyl because morphine is not effective. Fentanyl is initially effective but becomes effective quite quickly, so she has another rotation to oxycodone, which is effective, but unfortunately she develops a side effect of significant itch, varitis and we move to methadone, um, which has really good effect on small doses compared to the other medications <coughs> your T has been on. Um, and we introduce clonidine. So these are all medications that work on different aspects of the nerve pathway for pain. Um, so just to give you the second type of pain, neuropathic pain, the definition is that it arises from a lesion or disease of the somatocentric nervous system, whether that be in the peripheral site or in centrally central meaning, spinal cord or brain. So, this young, this is baby, uh, just shy of one year of age now, yeah. <clears throat> his advanced care plan is completed. Recognition that you know, on her finding that she was on a palliative trajectory, the pain is now well managed, and the pruritus is settling down after rotation. And she uh, dies uh, 25 days after her second. From what is uh, a terrible and rapidly advancing and difficult to control disease. Um, I have a we have a, a chance to have um, some questions uh, now just to cover that side of the, the talk um, before we move into a second um, present case to highlight another aspect. Of pain. Um, so please send any questions that you have through. And we can go from there. If I um, I'll just minimise the uh, screen. See if you've got any questions first. Okay. No, no questions uh, as yet, Ross. Okay. Um, I'll get you to bring up, sorry, I put up this, seems to have lost the report. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'll just scroll down to
the pun of organizations on BC. Right. Yeah. So the second case, um, this is of a 13-year-old boy who uh, is four years post management and, and out of four years post maintenance uh, finishing for standard risk ARR. And he presents at a follow-up clinic and he's had two months of right side and chest pain. The family are really concerned because the pain is similar to its original presentation with acute plastic leukemia. And everyone does what, what um, needs to be done and he, he gets his uh, full workup and everything's clear. Um, based on that, he's referred to the complex pain. His pain story is that the onset of pain happened after you sit in the upper right chest, which was over the old central sideline site um, by a ball wise pain soccer. Um, that was a stinging sensation. The only thing that was a little bit out of keeping was that it actually went on for a bit longer than you would expect you know, for a couple of days. But it did go away. Uh, but then he developed uh, um, another pain five days later. Uh, when he was accidentally bumped in the chest in the same area, but not exactly the same area, when he was at school. Um, and he describes the pain as a constant deep ache, like the leukemia pain. But he also has random flares of sharp shock-like pain, like getting a needle. That can be anything from once every third day to three or four flares per day. It's kind of no consistency in when it happens these and these flares last anything from a few minutes to an hour. Um, they're often associated with minor trauma, including being touched over the area uh, or getting light massage, which is family tried or when you get stressed, uh, school stress, spread stress, uh, being in pain stress. The intensity is anything, it averages 5 out of 10, but the range can be as low as 2, and that's with random. No good reason why that happens because he doesn't respond to energy, he doesn't respond to all the you know, use of heat packs and cold stuff. Um, and the flares come up as high as 8 out of 10. Um, and on examination, when you test the area sensitivity wise, he has pain to light touch and cold, and he has heightened levels of sensation. Um, so, chronic um, persistent uh, pain is, is what he has and, and, and the description for that is that it's a continuous or current pain that persists the past of long time of healing. And they used to subscribe a time frame of three months, but time frames are inadequate to explain chronic pain because children can develop these within a matter of a few days, they can have a chronic pain. I prefer to consider it a complex pain um, because it doesn't suggest that there has to be a time frame to it happening. Then there's, um, so this is the third descriptor of pain, it's called nociplastic pain. Uh, it came out as a, as a definition in 2018, so quite recent. Um, and it talks about this pain coming from altered nociception, even where there's no clear evidence of tissue damage. Um, that is, and the tissue, and the fact that there's no tissue damage, there's no obvious um, reason for the nociceptors to be active, um, and there's no evidence of disease in, uh, in the soft tissues or in the, in the nervous system. To explain it. So how does that work? Well, I refer you back to those two specialised uh, fibres, nerve fibres. Central node central sensitization. If you look at the top fibre, that's the small fibre. Um, the activation of those leads to an amplification and increase in the danger messaging to the central pathway. And that's known as hyperalgesia. Go down to the bottom, um, second 
of that diagram, the bottom one, the large fiber message angle, which normally goes on a pathway that does not interact with the home pathway, it gets diverted into the central pathway where, where the danger messaging goes and therefore is perceived as pain. So non noxious things like touch or warmth become painful. That's known as allodynia. And that's all due to the loss of the inhibitory nerve function. How does that work? So I'm going to run you through this um, slowly so that it, it makes a bit more sense because it's all physiology at the end of the day, it's all neurophysiology. So normally with acute pain you get a release of an exciting chemical called glutamate that activates a variety of different possible channels. What happens with chronic pain is that you get a big massive release of glutamate. That's a, and that, mean, that means that a normally closed channel called the NMDA channel, which is blocked by a little molecule of magnesium, it becomes open. So the big mass of release of glutamate displaces magnesium, opens the channel, and there's a whole cascade of events that happen that leads to loss of inhibition. But there's a third part of that pathway as well. So you've got the NMDA channel starting to signal when it shouldn't. You lose the inhibition from the nerve cells that do that job. And then you get activation of a particular group of nerves called nerve cells called microglia. Now like now like the surveillance uh, cells in the nervous system, they act very much like the white cells, which I'm showing you there's the macrophages, the white cells in the blood, they're looking for threat, they're looking to take out any um, obvious bacteria uh, and other such things, so the microglia is sort of a similar surveillance function when it gets lots and lots of danger messaging input and big surge in glutamate, the microglia increase in number and they become activated and they produce a lot of the inflammatory chemicals that you recognize to be present in peripheral tissue when you get a bruise. And they set up a low grade inflammation in the spinal cord. So it's in the nerve cells. So it's not visible on MRI scan and it's not visible through blood testing. And that leads to inflammatory response leads to sensitization just as much as the inflammatory response to the cut on the leg causes peripheral sensitization. And then we have our third pathway in the brain, the one that I neglected in the first case to tell you about. This is the pathway that goes through the limbic system or the emotional centers of the brain. So, and its first port of call is the amygdala, which is our fear center and our, um, so intimately involved with anxiety. And it's also our deep memory center. I mean, there's three centers for memory in the brain. There's the forebrain, um, which is like holding a memory. It's like holding water in your hands. So the memory will go really quickly. The second memory center is the hippocampus, which is like carving something into wood. It's there for quite some time, but it will go over time. And then there's um, Amygdala, which is like carving something into marble. It's pretty much there for, uh, for, for forever. So it's a deep memory center. So activation of the amygdala makes you more vigilant to make sure you don't work that area that's damaged again and you keep away from things that could damage it increases your vigilance of body sensations, so you take more notice of things that are happening in your body and they take a higher relevance than they should necessarily. Um, it increases your anxiety, it increases your general fear and your general worry and it makes you more attuned to what pain means. And it engages memories of previously painful experiences. So the amygdala is intimately involved with the effective 
emotional component of pain experience. So, as we said, acute pain is adaptive, it's recognizable, understandable, it's brief, but it improved rapidly, not so persistent pain, it's maladaptive. There's often no simple relationship with any kind of trauma. Trauma can be quite minor, it may even be absent. There's minimal or no bit tissue damage to, uh, to tie it to. Um, it presents for a much longer duration. It improves more slowly, and, this, and the improvement is often undulating. The times of improvement and times of influence are worsening. It. it responds variably to medication, and it can be associated with unhelpful changes in behavior. So, for this young man, 13 years of age, four years after he's off treatment, develops pain over the site of his previous central line scar after a small bump on the chest, following having a stinging football band there, very full. So he had central neural sensitization syndrome. The trigger was the recent repeated injuries, there are some psychological stressors, and he's had previous pain experiences, which actually come up in his description of his pain. What's the management? Well, we stop the simple analgesics which don't work, and they don't work, they're not going to work. We introduce gabapentin, start a desensitization program, and then gradually get him back into school, his activity, and sleep, um, change to a sleep budget. So the manager of chronic pain, <coughs> Is, uh, is a three-pronged approach, apart from medications, there's physical therapies and psychological strategies. I'll just run through those briefly. So chronic pain is an unpleasant but experience, but it's not dangerous. It's a false alarm perception, um, not engaging in normal activities, which often is the case, is harmful, and avoidance of activities causes its own problems. We'll talk about that shortly. The primary outcome is to get back to a normal development path. So physical. So you know the natural thing to do with an acute injury is to withdraw and rest from the activity. That's that's the response for acute pain. This works most of the time, and the injury heals up, and you're able to get active and resume again. However, with sensitization process. Even with no injury or injuries healed, the pain continues and rest leads to deconditioning, uh, which leads to more pain, which leads to pain even at rest or minimal activity. Whereas introducing physiotherapy and occupational therapy <coughs> is a really important part of the overall recovery, it reverses that downward spiral. Get a gradual increase pacing of activity. Um, it's ex exercise based on the child's goals, um, and that leads to improved endurance, to increased confidence, and you keep building and building. And over time, pain becomes less important and eventually reduces and goes away. Basically, you're retraining the brain back to normal activity. So functional restoration involves uh, desensitization to um, physical activity and normalization of movement, which in itself minimizes higher central changes and may reduce the fear and anxiety of movement. And you grade back uh, into the activities of daily living. The idea is just using the play and the just right um, challenge, normal positioning. Increasing weight bearing, shifting the, for example, the leg through a normal body movement and starting to work on decreasing daily behavior. So, gradually moving back to normality. Psychological strategies what's recognized and has been recognized for some time is that um, parents and families are often in stress and have a lot of stress related problems. Due to pain and when you get to the pain developing, uh, parental stress can predict 30% of child's functional disability. Um, and then there's the stress on the family itself, 
So uh, are, you that, are you parent who often have, have time off work, um, care for the child, computer appointments, uh, there's disruptive family structures, negative impact on siblings, uh, and this desire to find the medical cure, which can become a never ending cycle of disappointment and frustration and helplessness in the years. There's that underlying loss of what they saw the child being able to achieve in the future. And it's really common for children to miss part or all of school. I mean, it would be an unusual situation for a child coming through a complex life clinic not to have missed uh, a considerable amount of school. And so part of the work is about communicating with school, getting a great return program, um, active support of paid at school. So there's improved self-management, addressing any undesirable behaviour changes which have occurred, you know, identifying all those other stresses that go with school, whether that be direct bullying or indirect bullying, um, cyberbullying, um, it's something noticeably increased over the years <clears throat> through the pain clinic. And then uh, addressing avoiding behaviours and phobias around school. So, what's the psychological So, education, knowledge is power, stress management, and then cognitive techniques that allow the child to move forward. Distraction, relaxation, we've talked about it before, biofeedback, and then one of the more specific cognitive strategies, which, you know, a lot of the simple stuff can actually lead to significant change because it's considered to be the more involved cognitive behaviour. So the cognitive techniques, communication, 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 self-talk. The next slide will just delve into that a little bit more, but that's restructuring the way you think um, and encouraging the child to monitor and evaluate their negative thoughts and find alternatives. Uh, Coping skills training, so developing self statements, coping self statements, problem solving, and setting goals, which is where <clears throat> the wider team, the occupational therapy, and physical therapy really help as well. So, for self talk, let's consider a child who gets paid after exercise. I know something is wrong. Starts building to, it's going to get worse. Builds into, I'll end up in a wheelchair. I will not be able to walk. I will have to remain at home for the rest of my life, I won't be able to work. So it goes into a catastrophe. Right? Not uncommonly happens. Um, the reaction physically is this increased muscle tension, this fast breathing, which increases the pain. That impacts on the emotional side, fear, frustration, anxiety, and worry. What are the alternatives? I walk much more than normal. That's so much better than I did last week. I can expect sore as I start to exercise and get my muscles and think again. Here's the game. Or child gets pain after waking up, so no exercise. It's going to be a bad day. I'm not going to be able to do, get to school. I'm not going to be able to do my physical activity. I won't be able to do anything. I'll just have to die on the couch. Tension, fatigue builds up, anger, sadness, frustration. What are the alternatives? I don't know for sure that it's going to be a bad day. Sometimes I'm better when I get going again. I'm going to start with some small tasks and work from there. And so that mind shift can go a long way to changing the outcome and changing the level of pain. Um, just briefly on the pharmacology, um, a lot, this is a stylized example of the peripheral nervous system moving through to the central nervous system, the thalamus, thalamus sorry, and in the middle is the spinal cord and the dorsal cord, and that's where the interaction of the change of those pathways happens. And all along those pathways, there are points of potential alteration. So the peripheral sensitization, um, when the nerve is damaged or there's changes in the nerve structure, sometimes there's increased firing of, a, of the sodium channel there's alterations in certain channels within the nervous system we talked about before, and there's a loss of inhibition in the dorsal or 
so that sending an additional pathway is less active. All of those points is medication that can lead to change. Okay. We talked about ketamine earlier for that um, baby, clonidine also, opioids, and amitriptyline. Rather than work through that each one specifically, I'll talk about ketamine because it's something that is used not infrequently in cancer care, um, particularly also with treatment related mucositis. Um, should you remember this uh, diagram with the increase in glutamate and the opening of the EMDA channel? Simply, ketamine just goes into that channel and blocks it just as it would if it was magnesium and allows the network to reset the channel. So, medications in the central nervous system, whether that be neuropathic pain or no plastic pain, work in two ways. One, to improve the blocking or inhibitory action in the spinal cord. That's where the tricyclic and depressants such as amitriptyline work, they increase serotonin and more adrenaline, which makes that more effective, and opioids as we previously talked about. Then we've got reduction in the excitation in the spinal cord. So this is the NMDR tagging to ketamine we talked about to show. The other one is gabapentin, uh, which has come up a couple of times, and it works on that calcium channel in the spinal cord. We uh, showed a little bit earlier. There's clonidine, which works in a particular um, receptor involved in the sympathetic nervous system, the adrenergic uh, receptor. And that leads to reduction in a particularly noxious substance called substance P. Just think of it as substance pain. It is the sting you get when you have. Um, it releases substance free, that's where you get that burning sensation in your mouth. And then there's the sodium channel blockers like PKK, and that reduces the overactivity. So they all have a purpose, they all have a place of action, and sometimes you need multiple drugs to block different parts of it. So for this young man, he started gabapentin. And he was on a desensitization program, and so after six weeks, his touch sense to be in that area had resolved. He was very occasionally had random flares of pain at school, but they were only seconds long. So he's going to continue with the desensitization program. He had returned to school half days, five days a week, and now has a graded plan to go to full time, and his sleeping had returned to normal. Just before finishing and um, field any other questions, pain and blood cancers are related to disease, to treatment and procedures. It's not just disease we have to think about. And I think procedural pain management should be a serious priority. There are four simple approaches to success. Numbing, sucrose for babies, positioning um, and yeah. The fourth one escapes me, sorry. Um, then there's nociceptive pain. Analgesia determined by the pain severity as per the free ladder. Very amenable to pharmacology approaches, but non pharmacological measures are really important as well. And then neuropathic and nociceptive pain often require co analgesic agents. So all pain management should be include non pharmacological approaches or within a child family centered approach, or within the developmental trajectory of the child. So I hope what you've seen today convinces you that pain is a biopsychosocial phenomenon. At the heart of it is a nociception, so that's the triggering of the pain, uh, danger messaging. There's a whole lot of approaches at each level that can work to alter that. Around the nociception is pain perception, then suffering and then pain behaviours. But if nociception is not at play and it's central sensitization, it changes the landscape of treatment. It's much more down to physical modalities, down to relaxation and psychological strategies and restoring normal function 
along with a reduced use of the allocated for the other people. And if you're interested in learning more about pain, <clears throat> we're really fortunate to have the International Symposium Pediatric Pain being in Auckland. That was going to be next year. It's been, for obvious reasons, delayed a year, mid 2022. So, um, when the, you can see the website there that you can go to, uh, registration will open about a year out. So, look forward to seeing you all then and looking forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ross, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, let's see, let's pull you back to this view. All right. Cool. So we've got uh, three questions so far. So I'll read them out for you, Ross, um, and see if you can answer them. So we've got a question here from Linda Gray. Does the approach to management change at the palliative stage? Um, not particularly. I mean, I think in terms of the, the, what, what approach changes is more about dealing with those other aspects that go with palliative care. So I talked about advanced care planning, that's about finding out what the family's wishes are around the child's last days, about um, what they want to achieve or what the child, uh, if they would participate, um, want to achieve. And with the, that's about maintaining comfort, trying to uh, get some last sort of wishes done, which may be as simple as being able to go outside if they've been um, in, in um, the unit for the last 60 days, being out to go to outside. Uh, and all they, you know, so it's addressing those things. Uh, it's about planning for eventualities, but the focus is on comfort here, rather than focusing on I suppose that's the only sum of difference, but in terms of pain management, no matter what pain you have, non pharmacological as well as medications should be the multi modal approach to care. All right. Thanks, Russ. Um, next question here uh, from someone down in Wellington Are the pain pathways the same in an adult as for a child? Yeah, they are exactly the same. Um, in fact, there's really, some really amazing evidence that's come out since about the 80s, to be honest, that the pain pathways of the birth of a child are all there. Uh, it is just the way they um, develop that formulate to what an adult experiences. So, for example, premature babies have all the um, necessary pathways to experience pain. The only difference is that they experience pain in a generalized nature. So a heel prick left on a premature baby or a neonate is experienced as generalized pain because it's much more diffuse. The, the pruning that goes on in development hasn't happened in the pain pathway, so it's a much more generalized experience. So I'm to say for a baby, a heel prick left is the way worse than so they're all there, <clears throat> they're just refining um, over time, just as every other part of development refines over time to make the adult we are. Hmm. So does that mean like, because our, our um, pain pathways are all different, um, some procedures are sore for some people and other procedures, uh, the same procedure wouldn't be sore for other people? That, that's um, more to do with memory. <laughs> um, okay. So more to do with your perception or the way as a family unit you deal with painful experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a cultural element to that as well. One of the classics, if I, if I sidetrack most briefly within the next three minutes, um, mm -hmm. the Nepalese people uh, you know, they live in a harsh environment. It, it, they, they have to trek everywhere with 100 kilo packs on their backs, which is actually just 
carried with one strap across their forehead. They don't, you know, they have a hard life, there's expectation of hard pain, so they don't get um, as much credence as you perhaps um, can do in a, in, a, in, a, in a lifestyle which is not as hard. Uh, but they still experience pain, it's just about the expression of pain. Okay. All right. Um, an anonymous person asked, regarding the psychological management of pain, do you believe there is merit in the increasing research around language used? For example, rather than saying managing pain, saying improving comfort. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Languaging is really, really important. Um, and, sometimes, and, and every time um, there's an interaction, I remind myself about the languaging and if you use a word that you feel you need to adjust, just adjust it. Mm. Because it does impart, and I, I get exactly what you're saying, it does impart the ability to get through this. Um, managing versus improving, I uh, you know, perfect example of that. So language is highly important, particularly when you're talking about chronic pain. I think when you're talking about managing or dealing with uh, resolving disease in general. Hmm. Um, I think you've already answered this one from Wellington. Why do some people have a higher pain threshold than others? Yeah, partly um, I alluded to the, the learned experience um, as well as familial um, uh, experience, but also there probably are genetic um, variations amongst people that That, that's a it's a growing year of research. It's not as simple as this gene and that gene. It's multi genetic. Um, yeah. But yes, there are good examples of different pain experience with genetic variations. All right. And I think you answered this one as well, which is do newly born babies have underdeveloped pathways, meaning they are not they may not feel pain as significantly to begin with? Uh, yeah. I did answer that previously. They experience pain more than adults. Mm. They've got all the pathways necessary to experience pain. The pain is just not refined to a localized response, they get a generalized response. So a heel prick can be felt as general pain of the body. So, um, right. If anything, they feel pain in a bigger uh, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had just one final question from myself. Um, a lot of our adult patients uh, who are tuned in today, they deal with uh, peripheral neuropathy. Yes. Um, and just wondering how can these patients improve their pain management of this sensation? Yeah, peripheral neuropathy. So you're dealing with neuropathic pain. Um, so all of those non-medication techniques I talked about all have uh, validity and, and uh, can be really powerful. So improving breathing patterns, uh, looking at relaxation strategies, basically is building up a tool kit, a kit that you have that works for you of a variety of things you can go through. So you can't, you're not just stuck on one thing. I find I deep breathe for X amount of time, and that's all I can do, and nothing else can work. I haven't got anything else. It's actually have four or five other things to use, and sometimes you need guidance on developing those strategies, um, as well as the medication approaches. Uh, some of which, probably the main ones of which I don't put up today, but there are a variety of options, and sometimes it's trialing through some of those options to help. Sometimes there is a medication that's going to make a significant difference, mm. But get that kit in a full of options, including medications and non medication strategies. I think one of the main things that, um, that I've kind of learned from your talk today is that pain is a biopsychosocial. Uh, entity and so one of the things that we'll probably take away is trying to encourage our patients to get that psychological support yeah um, is there like anyone that you would or any kind of place you'd recommend in terms of psychological support for pain 
I, I think one first of all thing about psychological support is developing coping strategies. Okay. So it's not about deep and meaningful support the client. It's about coping strategies. So it can be very, very practical. Yeah. Pretty much every part of New Zealand has access. People have access to a pain service. Okay. And so at a, an adult pain service. Mm. On, you should be able to access pretty much anywhere in New Zealand through your BHG. Um, private pain specialists, much less uh, available, um, but they also don't have that multidisciplinary approach, which is so key to develop and that development of care. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ross Drake. Uh, we're really, really grateful and uh, happy to have you along and really learned quite a lot of things about uh, chronic pain. Um, our, um, your presentation will be up on YouTube uh, so our patients can access that there. Uh, and would like to thank those who uh, were able to tune in today uh, and wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you very much and uh, go well. All right. Bye-bye.